Okay, so thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm Joe Spanning. I, I did um, my PhD just after I finished residency, resident pharmacy at Goth um, in 2004. And I'm going to do a very fast research stop tour of pharmacometrics and our research. So essentially what motivated me to do my PhD and what is still motivating even in 2020 when this paper is published is that in terms of medicines, children are fed in plastic even. So um, only 14% of new drugs have a pediatric indication when they first come to market. And that comes down to 4% for babies. And it's understandable that when they first come to market, a lot of drugs might not have finished all the pediatric investigation plans. But in the next 12 years, only around 25% in Europe and worse in other places ever get a pediatric indication. So we're still in this position where the vast majority of drugs that we use in the hospital and you know, if you go to ICU, it's you know, for 90% of drugs are used outside their product license. So we have no good data on uh, dosing or safety or efficacy. So how do you do drug development? Well, drug development is a series of cycles of learning and confirming. So um, we, we learn things that our new molecule binds to a target in the lab, and then we might confirm that that then translates to a biological effect in an animal. We then learn things about the safety in uh, first in man studies and um, what's the optimum dose with um, modeling. And then the, the famous trials that are in the NEGM are actually confirmatory trials because of course, no one runs a multi-million pound randomized controlled trial if they're not fairly sure it's gonna work because they've learned a lot before. And all of this learning is coded up in mathematical PKPD models. And these big phase three trials are almost always impossible in children because thankfully most children are not ill. So we never have big enough numbers to do these big trials. So the PKPD modeling and the learning trials are, are even more important in children. Um, so I'll skip a lot of this because I know we're running out of time. I mean, this is just to say that understanding dose is really important. So the, I don't know if you remember this Norfolk Park incident of the, the TGN1412, but actually this was a dosing error because people um, used a hundred fold higher dose than they should have used because they didn't use the correct way to calculate the first in man dose. And we have to use similar principles to calculate the first in child dose. Um, so what the situation in sort of 2020 now, and going forward is that um, people have realized that understanding pharmacology and the quantitative aspects are really important. Having biomarkers increases your chance of success and we're moving towards this quantitative and computational approaches to, to pharmacology. So I'll just, that's the introduction to pediatric drug development. I'm gonna give a very brief introduction to pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and then just give you three examples from our work. So this is what happens with uh, pharmacokinetics. We're interested in how the body, pharmaco, uh, pertains to the drug and kinetics, how the drug moves through the body. And we tend to look at outputs like this, where um, as we go on with time after giving a dose, the concentrations rise and fall again. And the traditional way to, to uh, analyze these data is to report the maximum concentration, the time to reach the maximum concentration, to try and integrate the curve, working out the area under the curve, and then work out an elimination rate constant and extrapolate out to infinity. And this is all very well when you've got healthy volunteers and you can take 10 or eight samples after a dose interval. But if you've got a preterm neonate who you can only take 2.4 mils in a 24 hour, mils per kilo in a 24 hour period, so for 500 grams, 1.2 mils per kilo, for any purposes, you certainly can't take all of these blood samples. So we have to take a, a different approach and, and this is modeling. So we, we take fewer samples from lots of people, lots of children, and then fit mathematical models to them. Um, we also don't just think about pharmacokinetics. 
we think about pharmacodynamics, how does the, what the drug does to the body, how does the effect um, evolve in time. And this gets really difficult. So this is my sort of sketch of um, the, the difficulty that we've got. Pharmacokinetics is a curve like you've just seen, where this concentration versus time. At the site of action, where the drug binds to the um, target, which we can study really well in the lab, um, you often see this kind of shape. It's called the Hill curve or the Emax curve, where essentially, um, as you increase the um, drug concentration, the binding to the target gets higher and then it's the target saturates and then it plateaus off. But of course, in the body, we don't see this. We see this pharmacodynamics versus time. So the, what's happened here is that the, the effect has quickly risen, but then it's plateaued even while the concentrations are still rising because we've got to the maximum saturation. And then the concentrations start falling again, but the effect is still plateaued and then it falls away again. So it's quite complex to study. And um, you often get delays because we measure the drug concentration in the blood or sometimes the saliva or other places, but usually the blood. So we've got a concentration like that. This is what's happening at the site of action. But of course, the targets are not usually in the blood, they're somewhere remote. So what I've done here is I've simulated a small delay. And what you can see here is that when you plot the concentration versus the effect, you get this weird shape, it's called hysteresis, where essentially you've got the same effect, the same concentration, and you've got two different effects. So it's really difficult to work out. This isn't just a toy example I'm messing about. This is some real data. So this is uh, children who are having craniofacial surgery who receive remifentanil, and this is the effect on their mean arterial pressure. And you can see these hysteresis loops. So we have to use what ends up being fairly complicated mathematical models to try to understand these relationships because just plotting concentration versus effect can get confusing. So I'll just give you three examples um, from the spectrum of, of our group's research. The first one is in preclinical antimicrobial development. So we have a big interest in infectious diseases and we use this um, system called the hollow fiber cartridge where we can grow bugs trapped inside the cartridge and we pump uh, media through, so the bugs here have, can happily grow for weeks on end. Depending on the rate that we set these pumps, and we can then inject drugs and then gradually dilute the system, we can make the drug concentrations go up and down, just like they do in the body. And then we can identify the optimum dose. And here we've found out that um, a combination of three antibiotics where the bacteria were resistant to all three individually because they were synergistic when they were used together, um, some of the combinations could knock out the bacteria. So we can, we can work out things like this, like um, simulate the system in the lab. Another thing we can do is these learning trials, like I said, phase two trials. So this is a, a trial we did on triosulfan for conditioning in, in BMT patients, where we measured the pharmacokinetics and then we looked at outcomes. And what we found actually is that the patients who had higher AUC, higher um, exposure, even though they all had the same dose, um, the ones that had the higher exposure had more chance of, of post-transplant mortality. And we're trying to follow this up now in a uh, sort of a prospective trial to see if this is a true effect or it's correlation or causation. And then finally, we use um, real world data a lot. And I think Fan's gonna present a bit of her work on that. But this is some work, and actually Fan was involved in this one as well. So um, we wanted to understand the use of a drug called rituximab and how it affects the CD19, the B cells. And so we fitted a mathematical model to the B cell changes in time after doses. And these are the simulations from the resulting model, which showed us that actually we could get the very similar B cell trajectories with half the dose, which at the time when rituximab was still on patent, saved about three and a half thousand pounds per patient. So that's the end of the talk and that's my acknowledgement. And then welcome any questions.